Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the 26th lecture of the course on sociological perspectives on modernity. As you know, we are discussing the sixth module of this course, I mean deconstruction of modernity. In this module on deconstruction of modernity, we have discussed the feminist challenge to the critical modernist paradigm in sociology. We have also discussed the the response of the scholars drawn from cultural studies to the critical modernist paradigm in sociology. And in the last lecture, we started with the postmodernist challenge to the critical modernist paradigm in sociology. Okay. This is very important. Okay. And in the last lecture, we have discussed how postmodernism as a perspective on our economy, culture, and polity responded to or or thematically rejected the central philosophical and political foundations of modernity, namely holism or totality, okay, reflexivity, rationality and social movements. Okay. The central ideas we have discussed that postmodernism always tries to operate with okay, include culture, society, and the meta narratives. I mean, culture as produced and received is postmodern in form and content. That is how we tend to look at the controversies between modernist and postmodernist aesthetics. Then, society, I mean, especially political economy, can now be seen as having moved into a postmodern condition. I mean, the debates between modernity and postmodernity. And for a variety of reasons, the meta narratives which legitimate the knowledge of modern intellectuals that can no longer be sustained. I mean, here postmodernism rejects the claims that the enlightenment project propounded. I mean, all rationality, industrial revolution, development, uh, critical thinking, reasoning capacity, critique to the dominance of religion and so on. Okay. Postmodernism tried to reject such claims that the enlightenment project propagated. Okay. Then we have discussed postmodernist uh, aesthetics, I mean postmodernity as a historical condition and uh, then we have discussed how different developments within social and political theory can be presented as a series of contrasts. I mean, Fordist uh, production methods in contradistinction with post Fordist organization of production. We have also discussed there is a shift from the material production to the production of symbols, cultural artifacts and so on. And then we have also discussed how against the post second world war welfare state compromise, there is a shift to a neo conservatism based on the decline of collective bargaining and the weakening of the nation state. We have also discussed the distinction between old social movements and new social movements. We have discussed against the high culture and low culture division of modernist culture. There is a general shift to a fragmented and pluralist postmodern cultural configuration. There is a shift from socialization and determination of social relations to individualization and interaction above all with the spectacle. And there is a shift in the social construction of time and space or in their meanings. I mean history, place, community, identity, we have discussed in the context of Giddens also. Okay. Then we have discussed the postmodern condition, I mean Lyotards. Then we have also discussed one is uh, David Harvey and the other Frederick Jameson, okay. their approaches. Okay. And today we are going to discuss postmodernism as ontology 
not simply ontology, but also postmodernism as epistemology. This is very important. When I say postmodernism as ontology or epi and epistemology, to go back a little, as you know, what is ontology or what is epistemology? To know ontology or to know epistemology, we must understand the kind of questions the kind of central philosophical and political questions that epistemology addresses or ontology also addresses. Okay. What are the questions, what are the central philosophical and political questions that epistemology addresses? What is knowledge? How is knowledge produced? What counts as knowledge? And so, on. perhaps for this reason, epistemology is also known as a body of knowledge or a theory of knowledge. Then what kind of questions that ontology addresses? What is being? What is existing? Perhaps for this reason ontology is also known as a study of being, a study of existing, study of nature. In some ways, the claims of postmodernists to identify a specific historical condition which could be described as postmodern are incoherent in that they contradict some of the most important claims of postmodernism as a philosophy, as a matter of philosophical investigation. The, the identification of postmodernity as a historical condition, we have discussed this earlier, postmodernity as a historical condition. Okay. Now, we are trying to locate postmodernity as a historical condition in terms of ontological and epistemological questions. That is why, when I say the identification of postmodernity as a historical condition implies firstly a notion of a general and underlying social reality and secondly the claim that this reality can be described in holistic terms in other words as forming a whole bounded in time and probably in space. And in this sense postmodernist philosophy in fact forms a kind of anti-ontology or anti-social theory, in which both the idea of a holistic theory and the idea that this could have a rational relationship to some social totality are rejected. In some authors, this contradiction is resolved more or less convincingly. For example, Lyotard's account of the postmodern condition explicitly uses the idea of a shift towards information technology as a useful hypothesis whose ultimate truth status is apparently irrelevant. Lyotard's key argument is that these apparent shifts in social reality undermine the possibility of belief in the modernist view of the world and push us into postmodernism. And the difficulty here is that if this is in fact what is happening, it does not enable us to distinguish which of these two views of the world is in fact more valid. And while Lyotard himself might claim not to find this problematic, there is quite a strong implication in postmodernist philosophy that its anti-social theory or anti-theory is more valid than the previous modernist theory it, it critics. This is very important. If this is true, nevertheless, not only does it need legitimation by a historical account of how we have arrived at this new and more valid perspective, but that perspective itself would prevent us from offering such an account. In other words, it may well be that postmodernism is necessarily faced with a choice between treating postmodern philosophy as simply an effect of postmodernity as a historical condition and effectively ditching that the historical account in favor of the philosophy. And this later approach seems rather more promising, I mean ditching the historical account in favor of the philosophy. Okay. Okay. This, is, this is very important. And then postmodern philosophy is effectively an extension and radicalization of post-structuralist thought sharing a number of features, notably the rejection of holistic theories that no theory can be holistic, no theory can have uh, 
the element of totality okay and the idea of totality in favor of theories of multiplicity the rejection of the idea of the unitary subject in favor of theories of heterogeneity or of intersecting language gaps in the case of leotard now let us first see what does it imply when we say that no postmodernism is not in favor of any holistic theory precisely because for postmodernists there is nothing called the truth unlike modernists for modernists there is the truth but for postmodernists no truth may be uh, if something is true if something constitutes the truth okay maybe from a single vantage point from a single perspective from a single lens we have multiple lenses here what i see as truth what i see as constituting the truth may not be truth may not be true for you there is a different dimension now now the critics to postmodernists also say that no there is only one truth but from 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 multiple dimensions there is only one truth but from multiple dimensions okay critics to post but postmodernists suggest that no there are multiple truths that's why there are multiple forms of knowledge products that's why the rejection of the idea of such uh, unitary subject in favor of theories of heterogeneity of intersecting language games i mean that what is that theory of heterogeneity i mean the way postmodernists tried to reject the idea of homogenization of cultures tried to reject the the idea of any sort of homogeneity because the, in this world in our society in our economic culture and polity we don't see only one way to produce knowledge we see multiple sources of production of knowledge our sources of production of knowledge are also pretty heterogeneous they are not homogeneous okay this is very important okay that's why postmodern philosophy is effectively an extension and radicalization of post structuralist thought sharing a number of features namely the rejection of holistic theories and the idea of totality in favor of theories of multiplicity and secondly the rejection of the idea of the unitary subject in favor of theories of heterogeneity and so on. an idea which is not unchallenged in post structuralism but becomes an orthodoxy in post modern but becomes becomes quite orthodox in post modern philosophy is the primacy of the text over the social text is more important than the social theory that you find or social reality that you find now how to define a text it depends on the author as well as the reader we have seen how foucault retains an interest in institutional analysis and the organization of social relations in postmodernist writing with some exceptions like macrobi i mean texts are taken to be the sole constituent of reality so that the assumption of a deep social reality underlying these everyday surfaces is rejected i mean when i say macrobi angela macrobi suggests that no texts which can include things like television advertisements or everyday conversations and so on are taken to be the sole constituent of re reality that's why postmodernists try to postmodernists for example macrobi they try to put more emphasis on texts than the social they try to put texts on a higher pedestal vis-a-vis -vis the social reality texts are more important than the social theory or social reality okay and when i say that television advertisements or everyday conversations or the uh, assumption of a deep social reality underlying these everyday surfaces is rejected i mean these surfaces in one version of things are reality and the idea that there is anything behind them is akin to the belief in god this is of course only really sustainable on the basis of a rejection of 
determination and causality, so that the texts of the everyday conversations carried out at the stock exchange or of administrative regulations are treated as having no greater influence over events than the texts of conversations in the pub or of the latest movie. This is in, in effect version of the post structuralist em emphasis as the signifier as opposed to the signified or in other words of, uh, of language rather than the subject objects of language which are human beings uh, talking about their relations with one another. In the Foucaultian approach, the separation between signifier and signified is effectively denied, so that administrative regulations for example, are seen as being at one and the same time statements about reality and statements which constitute a particular reality. Now, what is signifier, what is signified? We have discussed this earlier in the context of Derrida's deconstruction uh, and so on. And such approach, such Foucaultian approach has some strong methodological support, although it restricts us to an examination of only some aspects of reality and is likely eventually to prevent us from making necessary distinctions between uh, distinctions such as the distinction between practice and norm, ideology and practice or from identifying patterns of determination. When I say ideology and or norm on the one hand and practice on the other, when I say ideology or norm, I mean what is said, what is prescribed, but when I say practice, actually what is done. In this sense, other post-structuralists along with post-modernists tend to deny the existence of the signified at all and this is the meaning of the emphasis on surface appearances and the denial of any deep realities. And these surfaces themselves are then interrogated within a particular set of assumptions, notably their status as texts which derive at a greater or lesser remove from literary criticism and literary philosophy. This dramatically logocentric approach which has no place for meanings or practices other than those embodied in language points to one of the central origins of post structuralist and post modernist thinking which is I think to be found within a particular intellectual trajectory, intellectual historical trajectory. For much of the 20th century in particular under the influence of Marxism, but more generally under the influence of historical and sociological thought, the, the knowledge of literary uh, intellectuals has been devalued in practice. At the same time, literature has retained a high degree of status, for example, in, in Weber's terminology in part precisely because of its luxury status, the legitimation of art as non-instrumental activity and of a literary education as the hallmark of those who could afford not only an education, but also an education which was not immediately professional or vocational in nature, I mean all creative. Okay. Then such situation has of course, been challenged by dissident literary intellectuals such as Raymond Williams in the case of cultural studies we have discussed. But here Raymond Williams also is becoming important in the case of postmodernism as ontology and epistemology. Thus literary intellectuals have had a high degree of status, but a declining amount of power in society as a whole and a declining intellectual credibility in intellectual circles. In effect their knowledge has been dramatically devalued over the past half century by comparison with historical and sociological knowledge. Much of the subtext of the arguments not just around post structuralism and post modernism, but also around for example, cultural studies or feminist writings is about literary intellectuals attempting to revalorize their knowledge as a substitute for sociological knowledge and sociologists attempting to keep them out. In other words, it is about what counts as valid knowledge. If the social world only consists of texts, then literary knowledge has priority. If the social world has a reality of its own, then literary knowledge uh, ceases to exist in this sense. And the most characteristic element of postmodernism nevertheless is what has become known as the skepticism towards meta narratives or grand narratives. In other words, the accounts of reality 
which are claimed to underpin modern thinking, modernist thinking, whether it is affirmative or critical. This is often formulated as a direct or indirect uh, polemic against Habermas's arguments about the enlightenment project as something which remains to be completed against the irrationality of the dominant structures of society and the two discourses on modernity. I mean an idea he uses to contrast the dominant version of affirmative modernity with the counter discourse of critical modernist paradigm in sociology. For example, Lyotard phrases the argument in this way, modernist thought depends on one of the two myths or meta narratives. What are those myths? The myth of truth that there is nothing called the truth, there is nothing called this a single truth that is why it is a myth for Lyotard, the myth of, or postmodernists. The myth of truth represents the dominant technical scientific approach or in terms of this course affirmative modernity. Then what is the counter that, uh, that counter discourse of critical modernity? That is it has I mean then we will we'll come to this point. I mean such the myth of such myth of truth has to do with the assumption of an unproblematic objective and external truth which can be discovered by the scientists and whose progressive discovery will enable a greater and greater control of the world and hence an improvement of living standards and so on. This, the second myth or the second uh, meta narrative that is the myth of liberation is clearly related to critical modernist paradigm in sociology or to Habermas's counter discourse of the enlightenment project. That the myth of liberation has to do with the ideas of emancipation from our social conditions, with the development of critical and reflexive thought processes and with social movements as the agency of our self emancipation. Both of course, both these myths, myth of truth and myth of liberation, okay, they relate to some idea of the social whole or totality in both this relationship is rational in form. And such attack on these myths or meta narratives, myth of truth and myth of liberation, then makes use of such attack on these meta narratives, makes use of the different points that I have mentioned earlier. I mean, a reject the, the way postmodernists rejected the idea of holism or totality, the way postmodernists rejected the idea of the subject in whose search for truth for, or emancipation these narratives are grounded. I mean in terms of reflexivity and in terms of their legitimacy and also a rejection of the idea of hidden depths to be understood. What we are then presented with a, is a mixture of anti-realism or anti-rationalism and Nietzschean relativism, Frederick Nietzsche. I want to explain each one of these points very briefly. Firstly, anti-realism. Okay. Then we will discuss anti-rationalism and then we will discuss Nietzschean relativism. What is this anti-realism? Firstly, anti-realism, I mean realism is a technical term implying the assumption of the existence of a deeper reality than the surface reality we are immediately presented with. As we have seen, postmodernism rejects the idea for example of capitalism as an underlying reality which we can know either eventually or indirectly and replaces this by an ontology of surfaces in which what you see is what you get. Clearly, if this is accepted, sociology if it survives at all has to give up any claims at analysis or discovery in favor either of simple description or of formalist claims. Secondly, why anti-rationalism? The attack on rationalism mixes elements of Foucault's charge that humanist ideals of reason are in fact the governing ideologies of a disciplinary society with the Frankfurt school skepticism towards instrumental reason, instrumental rationality okay, of all kinds as well as with more general and philosophical statements about the failure of reason. In effect what is said is that logic is firstly internally inconsistent in mathematical terms and secondly this argument cannot legitimate itself. That, that particularly the second one that this argument cannot legitimate itself is probably true by definition. If internal legitimations are taken as circular and external legitimations are only accepted if they are 
fully consistent with the system of thought under discussion, we are effectively looking for an external justification which is also an internal one and we will get nowhere. And when we say this such logic is internally inconsistent in mathematical terms, this is perhaps more serious because it is important to stress that it only applies if and this is a very big if, if you know it, if we treat reason or rationality in as identical with a particular set of logical and mathematical operations. In other words, if we assume that rationality exists in the abstract separate from any social ground. And thirdly, however, these charges are brought together in a return to Nietzsche's relativism. It to make a crass oversimplification Nietzsche was already arguing at the end of the 19th century that the idea of an absolute truth was a myth and that intellectual conflict was in effect a power struggle to determine which way of viewing the world should prevail. This is relativist in so far as it rejects the idea of any priority of one way of thinking over another. It treats rationality as just one imperfect way of thinking about things among others and it rejects the idea of an external reality to which we can appeal. Something like this is also suggested in at least some postmodernist writings and there has been something of a return to Nietzsche in philosophy. What is perhaps missed in the rush to use Nietzsche against critical modernist paradigm in sociology is that Weber's critical modernist paradigm in sociology was already built on this kind of skepticism about rationality. Just as postmodern tends to uh, postmodernism uh, tends to squash Marxism or modernity into boxes which leave out a lot of their real complexity, so some of the complexity of other critical modernisms gets ignored. Okay. Then in this section, we have tried to look at postmodernism, postmodernity, postmodernism as ontology as well as epistemology. Okay, how texts are more important than the social reality for postmodernists. Okay. Now, we will complete this lecture by looking at feminism and postmodernism as a test case. The last thing that I would like to mention is the encounter between feminism on the one hand and poststructuralism and postmodernism on the other, which is by any standards one of the key encounters in contemporary intellectual politics. That is the issue being whether the two form part of a common assault on the tenets of both critical and affirmative modernist paradigm in sociology or whether it transpires that the two are incompatible and that feminism is effectively a renewal and transformation of critical modernist paradigm in sociology. There is by now a large literature on this subject books such as Barrett and Phillips destabilizing theory or Linda Nicholson's feminism postmodernism are obvious places to start with. But the issue is a central one in much if not uh, most contemporary feminist theory and cultural studies. Initially a large number of feminists were attracted by the by the project of poststructuralism and postmodernism for a number of reasons. I mean it, it legitimated feminism, legitimated the idea of a multiplicity of relations of power rather than a single dominant totality. The proponents of modernity suggested they rejected this and on this point feminism joins postmodernist thought that feminism legitimated the idea of a multiplicity of relations of power uh, rather than a single dominant totality. This implies that issues of gender, class and ethnicity could be taken separately rather than uh, requiring for example, a subordination of the women's movement to the struggle against capitalism or a subordination of black women's struggles to a single struggle against patriarchy such that, that category of difference must be identified, must be understood. Thirdly, the anti-essentialist argument that the category that women was a cultural construct rather than an ontological reality related to earlier arguments about the social nature of gender. Fourthly, the delegitimation of reason was simultaneously a delegitimation of a particular kind of knowledge within which women had been either excluded or subsumed into a single universal account. Fifthly, for essentially contingent reasons, women were rather 
more likely to possess literary critical knowledge than sociological knowledge although the field of literary criticism as a whole is dominated by men. Nevertheless, there has been an increasingly sharp reaction by other feminists against such development for a number of reasons. First, the deconstruction of the subject and the essentialist category women makes any feminist account, let alone one geared towards social movements, extremely difficult to sustain. Secondly, postmodernism's relativistic attitude to truth and ethics makes it difficult either to maintain that the issues raised by feminist research were more significant sociologically than other, than other possible subjects or that they had any greater moral legitimacy. Thirdly, the focus on texts enables certain kinds of women's experiences to come through but excludes others effectively placing a premium on articulation. Articulation. And fourthly, last not but not the least, most obviously on any account of concept of patriarchy is a meta narrative which underpins much, if not most, feminist intellectual activity, whether academic or political, postmodernism's rejection of meta narratives in effect undermines not just the enlightenment project but also the feminist project. And these issues are still highly debated ones on both sides. The outcome is crucial for the survival of critical modernist paradigm in sociology as an intellectual and political project. What is at stake, of course, is the question of whether the feminist critic points towards the need for a restructuring and rethinking or whether it points towards the need to scrap the paradigm in favor of a very murky postmodern future. Then in this module, what we have discussed, we have discussed the challenges to critical modernist paradigm in sociology or the way critical modernist paradigm in sociology was deconstructed through three different lens, lenses, feminism, cultural studies and postmodernism. Okay? And in this particular lecture, we have discussed postmodernism as ontology and epistemology and feminism and postmodernism as, as a test case. And in the lectures to follow, what we are going to do? We are going to discuss, I will be looking at authors working within a critical modernist perspective. I mean, how different authors uh, working within a critical modernist perspective uh, have come to terms with the challenge offered by post-structuralism and post-modernism on the one hand and feminism on the other. The argument which is offered is generally an acceptance of acceptance both. There have been changes in the social organization and that sociology needs to consider new feminist methodological philosophical issues. However, it is claimed all of this uh, claimed that all of this can be done without abandoning the critical modernist paradigm in sociology. I mean all those four central pillars of modernity, holism or totality, reflexivity, rationality and social movements without rejecting them, how we can redesign different methodological, philosophical, feminist, post-colonial, post-modernist perspectives. So, the key intellectual questions are not whether patriarchal relations have to form a central part of social theory, but whether this can be done with a critical modernist approach. Not one of whether economic organization has moved beyond Fordism or not, but of whether this means that we have moved out of modernity. Not one of whether technological rationality is problematic, but one of whether modernist perspectives reduce down to that only. Then we tend to forge a new totality. The next lecture, we are going to discuss a new totality and then we will discuss radicalized modernity and then we will discuss some um, you know, one hour lecture, we will discuss uh, uh, how different authors from India, how India looks at modernity, okay? maybe Gandhi, maybe Tagore and so on, we will see, maybe Amartya Sen, okay? the argumentative Indian and so on, maybe Dipankar Gupta, mistaken modernity. Okay? Now, in the next lecture, we will we'll discuss a new totality, I mean empirical responses to the postmodernist tradition, then totality, 
I mean all four elements have to be evaluated in this in the context of new totality. Okay. I mean totality, holism or totality, uh, social movements, reflexivity and rationality. Okay. Then we will try to evaluate such account of a new totality. Okay. Thank you.